So eye contact even, you got to think about that. Do I overreact? Do I underreact? <coughs> I see these little smirks like... <laughs> we all do, yeah. We all have our days. Self-control. Everybody needs to have a self-control plan. And this is stuff you can use and teach to your clients. So maintaining self-control in some of the difficult circumstances, maybe somebody's in crisis, um, it's hard. But we're professionals. That's what's expected. Our job is to take energy away. Right? None of us is thinking very clearly, even in a little crisis situation. So what's your self-control plan? If we don't have a plan, we react. For me, it's very simple. When I, when I feel like my amygdala is starting to go off, there's a crisis situation. I don't want to get pulled in and make things worse. I take a big deep breath and I try not to make it sound like a sigh. And I remind myself that all I can control is right here. I don't need to stop this behavior right in the moment unless it's very dangerous and you know we got to do what you got to do. But I don't need to just jump to stop this behavior. I need to control my reaction. Again, so I'm taking energy away. And then we need to look underneath for what's the real need, feeling, or request. But make sure you have something that, that brings you from here back to here yourself. Whatever that is. And how to practice it. Be aware of it. Because the way we present our attitude and our sense of self-control that's what we need to model, right? This business can just suck the life out of you sometimes. I am so passionate about what I do, and I love the people that I serve and the things that we can do for them. But it gets to the point sometimes where I'm living, eating, and breathing. I'm on call almost all the time. So it really is kind of a part of my life. But that, that's okay. Um, but I have to have things. I make that time where I don't answer them. I make the time to transition into my life. Because it collapses into each other very easily, and then we start to become kind of, we see the whole world as, as what we do, and forget to be present in the moment with our families, be present in the moment with our loved ones, whatever. What are your self-care rituals? We have to keep that balance, right? I believe we have like these three voids in us, gas tanks, if you will. One's spiritual, one's emotional, one's physical. However you want to label them. But if you're not taking care of your emotional self, and that runs low, and you're just off kilter, if you're not taking care of your physical self, again, you got to pay attention to these things. We're so used to doing it for everybody else. We have to make sure we... We are the tool that we use. We're the most important tool that we use. So if we're not really purposely doing this, do you have hobbies that we fuel you? Do you have stuff? Gardening, what? Cooking, what? Gardening? It's real therapeutic. Working. I need to have things because I'm a task kind of person. I need to have checklists, right? I need to have something when I get home that I can go, aha, done. Floor them up, laundry done. You know, something where I feel like it's just accomplished, you know. I need to have some task oriented things. Are you eating well? Are we all running through McDonald's on our way to the next planet? It, I, you should see my car. I got the trash in it. Too. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But you need to do some purposeful things to maintain your balance. And I have to do some things that are very symbolic sometimes, especially after a really hard day. Um, first thing I usually do, I, music is my thing too. I love music. So I get in the car and I crank up the radio and I just sing all the way home. Thank goodness no one can hear me. And if you see me, I'm not talking to myself. <laughs> that just gives me, I've got about a half hour drive home, so that helps everything, you know. And then I give myself a few minutes towards the end of the drive to kind of go over the day. And then I try, try, try to let it go. I get home, my dogs act like they haven't seen me in 10 years, and that always feels good. Oh, mom, you're home. But I take off the day. I literally change my clothes, take a shower, put on my comfy sweats, and I'm on top of my family. It's very, it helps me with the transition because I'm on call a lot, and it is, you know, I'm kind of attached to the phone. 
So make sure you're building those things and that time into your life. Because if you're not, everybody says, I don't have time. I don't have time to go to the gym. I don't have time for walks. I don't have time for this. I don't have time for that. Yeah. If you don't make time, you're going to crash and burn. So make time for you. So back to kind of, why did you choose this job? We know it's not money. We've already decided that. We work in an environment and a system that's under-resourced and very challenging to navigate, let alone work in or um, deal with every day. When we provide services, we're, we're privileged to provide these services for individuals who have extremely challenging lives. There's so many things that we need to help them overcome. And it comes with certain risks, our physical and emotional risks, right? Did you know that coming in? Did you know that coming in? Some people, you know, and, and, and if you have to be really honest with yourself, because if you are in this for, if it's just a paycheck, it's not a place to be. If you give your heart's not in it, right? If you're really not passionate about the work that you do, remember it's no fun for you. You know, and it's just really not effective all the way around if you're just kind of going through the motion. Any really cool stories about how you got to be where you are now? Why you're in this field? What? I'll start since you guys are such a chatty bunch. Um, <laughs> my daughter has uh, three different diagnoses. She's got um, pretty severe OCD. She's got ADD and a little Tourette's. Uh, I was a medical nurse for the first half of my career, and then when my daughter turned 13, it was like, bam, the hormones hit, and all these things started coming to light. I said, whoa. And so we got all this diagnosed, and then of course that got me, wow, thinking about all the other families who are dealing with this, and all the other things that are going on up there. I'm going to do this. I want to help with them. That's why I am where I am now. Just remember, think about your attitude, mood, and motivation every day. So now let's, let's move into how can I ensure that I'm working with clients in a kind of a proactive way and an engaging and trauma-informed manner. The first place I like to start is behind every behavior that we see coming at us is a very legitimate feeling, request, or need, right? A big part of our job is meeting needs, customer service. My nurses know that I expect customer service excellence from them. It's our honor to be serving them. We're working for these folks. If you think about what are some of the more basic and higher human needs? Maslow. Right. The bottom round. Food, safety, shelter. Right there, we're stuck with a lot of your folks, right? Right there. <coughs> Not a lot of your folks have. <coughs> A nice roof over their head, right? We've got some homeless people. Maybe it's not a safe home. <coughs> it's a chaotic environment, right? So, I mean, Maslow was no dummy. We, we really can't move forward unless these basic needs are not threatened anymore. Food, shelter, safety, that need for sleep, belonging, and acceptance is huge for our, our folks. Again, when I worked at Salem Memorial Hospital, Many, uh, we did kind of a mini survey and said, what are your three main goals? And my three main goals. And what it came down to was I want to be able to uh, live on my own. I want to have a job and I want to date on Saturday night. So thinking about basic needs, need for safety comes with a lot of fear. So we already have folks who are traumatized. So the fear is up in paranoia and anxiety. Someone who doesn't have a house, higher anxiety and fear that's starting to really interfere with cognitive clarity, right? So pile any other things on top, and I'm sure there's many for, for the people that you're serving. And again, you have to remember how hard it is for these folks to learn new ways of reacting to the world around them, new ways of expecting the world around them to, to react to them. Frustration and powerlessness is another big one that I think our folks deal with, yes? Lots of frustration around housing and money and, oh my God, another another group I have to go to. Oh, another, you know, session. 
But basically, if you think about it, it's the need to be heard again. Someone's coming at you with frustration, listen. And of course, we know choices, choices, choices. If there's any way we can lend some sort of choice uh, in a situation that helps. There's a lot of hopelessness in the people that we serve. Not only, like I say, those basic feelings of hopelessness and not being able to get housing, not being able to get the treatment they need, um, but because they're stuck in that traumatic reenactment. There's just this sense of kind of emotional homelessness. Because they just keep reacting the same ways, right? So when people aren't skilled at getting their needs met, what happens? They resort to survival skills. How many of the folks that you work with have come right, are off the street or still on the street? <coughs> A lot? Yeah. You want to talk about somebody who's working under this trauma response at all times? How much fear do you think you have if you're living on the street? 24-7. Yeah. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. So we've got to get past that. Again, that's why it takes a lot of time to figure out where to engage, how to feel, make someone feel safe enough to actually start to make some changes. Patience, patience. And repetitive stuff. So we have the same groups and the same treatment and the same things that we're doing because we need to. It needs to be over and over and over again. So what about these labels? You got someone, what's, what do you think of when you see the word manipulative? Everybody goes, oh. All my clients. All my clients. They're all in the hustle. All words in the hustle. There's a lot of it. We see a lot of manipulation. But definition of manipulation is creatively getting your needs met. But, but, a, lot of, but a lot of that manipulation comes from survival skills. Exactly. Because, because I've been homeless, and I and I know that, that that you know once you get into that that part of the situation, most people see that as not, and it is manipulation. But it's a but, survival skill to get what you what you want and to get what you need to get from point A to point B. Well put. That's exactly my point. And don't we all manipulate our environments every day to get our needs met? <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. So survival skills. And, and using these words to describe people, oh, well, we'll get into that. You know, no, I'm going to say it now, because as we're talking about these labels, attention seeking, if somebody is seeking your attention, what should you do? Give them the attention. <laughs> Set your boundaries, but give it. Okay? Someone needs, there's something, what's under that? What's under the attention seeking behavior? It's a need. What is the need? We have to be detected. What's underneath that? Uh, is this person's perception of how important this need is skewed by trauma? Most likely. So it's up to us to kind of help reframe things and help prioritize things in, in folks' lives. Another one I don't like is entitled. I, I see that. I see it. I see it in charting. Uh, what does that mean? I mean, we're all entitled to live and be safe and have a home, and yeah, I might have a right to be acting like 